good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, I appreciate it. I just did want to footnote. Uh, Mr. Brown had an emergency come up, and so he is unable to be here. So I just wanted you to know he was scheduled to be with us, but unfortunately he got pulled away at the last minute. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Yeah. Russell's. I think we had a video. It'll come up shortly. But thank you all for being here for the District 4 Mayor's Town Hall tour. Uh, Mayor had decided that instead of a riveting speech about the state of the city, uh, we would do a town hall tour where we get to participate and support him as he shares all of the different projects and initiatives and work that has been underway over the last several um, months. And it's pretty crazy to think it's been almost two years and you'll hear how many wonderful things that we've been working on all across the city under many different buckets of um, uh, information that you'll receive today. So we'll start by um, passing it over to my colleague, uh, Councilman Duval. Thank you, um, Dr. Bussels. We're glad to be with you. Back in my home district of District 4, um, we, we have moved down into District, what is now District 2 now, it was District 3, so but delighted to be with you all tonight and hope we have a, a lot of information that you'll enjoy hearing. I get excited every time I see that video um, because it really gives a, a good overview of how cool our city is and, and how we should be telling everybody about it. And as I, I get to travel around and meet with people, I, I'm always talking about Columbia and, and how we're not just a college town. We're this incredible community filled with so many interesting people and businesses and backgrounds and stories and we always argue that hey we're, we, we need to have these conversations and we need to tell people who we are and how important it is that people are engaged um, in our community in a positive way because we're on our way to be the number one city in South Carolina and we're doing it by working together and everybody's a piece an important piece of the puzzle we want people to be part of that. And so when you think about that, remember that piece of the puzzle. What am I doing to be part of that piece of the puzzle? I do want to thank, obviously, my colleagues who are here for all the help and work. We've been working together. And what you'll hear is a, a, a theme more surrounded around we than I, because we are doing things together. We always don't agree on every point, but what we try to do is do the best we can to improve. And I would like all of the senior city staff that's here to stand up and I'd like y'all to give them a hand because without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important that as we're communicating and working and, and um, you know, I'm in City Hall almost every day, and, and part of that is is that we're interacting and working together and communicating about what's important uh, for our city and how we need to improve and how we want to invest with our, our employees and making sure they have the tools and the talent and the technology to do their job to provide you all the customer service. Are we there yet? 
we're getting there. Do we want to improve every day? Absolutely. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we're trying town halls is how can we have a little more um, interaction at, at the level in, in neighborhoods with people directly. Um, we're going to continue to try this and see how it works and get more engagement. Um, but we're going to talk tonight a little bit about citywide initiatives, break down you know, the updates in, in your district towards the end, but a lot of it is we tried to reach out ahead of time and get some questions in, and, and, but we do have cards here for you to ask questions afterwards so that we can get you a written response because I know people have very specific questions that they want answered, so we want to be able to do that. Um, and that's out back. Our, our city staff has it out there at the tent along with a lot of information. When you came in, you saw a scrolling. Uh, uh, there's like 150 things that we've been doing and going on, everything from Love Your Block to working on a homeless plan, investing in our police and our fire departments, making sure every, every city employee is compensated correctly but also has the tools and the technology to actually do their job. Part of that is, is that we decided, you know, we took on Mayor Benjamin's theme of we are one Columbia. Every business, every public service, every neighborhood, district, law enforcement officer, firefighter, elected official, government official, school, church, and citizen are part of the city. So we can't talk about one without the other. Everybody is a piece of that puzzle. If we're not working together, then we're not advancing the ball. So for us, our, our goal was how do we improve the quality of life for every citizen and every employee with the mindset that we're in the customer service business. Our job is to take care of you as a customer. And uh, I'm excited about what we've done and where we've grown and where we're coming. Um, I wake up every day excited about this job because Columbia has so much to offer. I just was in Atlanta at the U.S. Conference of Mayors leadership meeting on public-private partnerships. And once again, Columbia is being mentioned over and over about the things that we're doing together. The pilot programs that are coming out with Instacart to work on food security. Uh, the investment that we're looking to do in a Hope Center. These partnerships are bringing people together, but also bringing resources and notoriety, quite frankly, across the country. People are recognizing that we're a capital city. Sidebar, why that's important to me is because when I was coming back from a meeting two weeks ago, I'm in the airplane, in the Delta plane, and I'm watching the Sky Tracker, and guess what city's not listed on there? Augusta's on there, Charleston's on there, Charlotte's on there, but Columbia's not. So we <laughs> spent the better part of the day, the other day, talking with leadership at Delta to get Columbia put on that flight tracker. We are the capital city of South Carolina. We should be on that map. With a star. And, and I think it's important that we continue to, to, to promote ourselves and push and people to get recognized what a great community we have. Um, we can't do everything. I know people expect us to do everything, but we can't. But we're, 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 we're going to continue to to lead where we can, unite the community, advance new ideas, and continue to listen to people. And I, when we say that, we adapted you know, this theme of Open Columbia. It's open for business, but it's open for ideas. It's open for complaints. We take those complaints as compliments, because if you, if you didn't tell us, we'd never know and we can't improve. And I think it's important that we, we continue to work together. And you know, I, I really you know, have to thank the staff again. Uh, along with the leadership because everybody's working to make sure that, that we're doing things to improve our community, but also taking care of some of these unfinished projects. Finley Park, for one. You know, the Vista Greenway, the ability that we had to work with Dominion Power, now we have 200 more acres available on the riverfront. Why is that important? Because now we can expand a trail. We can take advantage of ecotourism. Every time I'm on that river, I meet people who are from all over the country. They've come here because they've heard about the river. There's not many places in the southeast that have class two rapids, Spanish moss, and the settings that we have. When you bring the Santee and the, I mean the Saluda and the Broad into the Congaree, you have something a lot of people don't have. We're geographically situated in a beautiful place because we have three major highways that connect us all over within hours. We have 16 million, okay, 
15.8 million visitors. <laughs> Fudged it to 16 because I want to get there. Coming here to visit our city. But we're only getting five and a half million to spend the night. We've got to create more opportunities and take more reasons for people to stay here. That means more restaurants. That means more hotel nights. That means people spending money in our retail stores, into our, our, our other stores, taking advantage of everything from Soda City to our arts, all of the things that make us who Columbia is. Um, so I hope that tonight will give you a snapshot of what we're doing. You know, the riverfront expansion was a big part of that, but also really working with our partnerships. We meet on a monthly basis with the county, talking about how we can work together, meeting quarterly, regionally with the other mayors. How do we support each other? It's no longer, oh, I'm worried about my piece of pie. It's us going, let's, let's work on this together. Scout Motors being here and coming here is a great thing for the city of Columbia. It's a great thing for Blythewood. It's a great thing for Irmo and West Columbia and Casey because they're investing in the region. They're not just investing in one area, and I think that's just so important. You know, but we need to continue to have the input from you. And so with that, I'd like to just kind of talk a little bit about public services and our essential functions. You know, we constantly working with our departments and learning from them how to have a safe, clean, enjoyable, and accessible city. And part of that's having conversations with our employees, understanding what are some of the hurdles, what's preventing us from doing the best that we can. And sometimes it's our own, we're getting in our own way. And so learning from them how we improve. We went on a tour last year and met with the majority of, of hourly employees and got feedback from them. I learned from them what we were doing wrong, why we were having issues hiring, how we were set up, and how we could improve. But we're continuing to invest, and it's far beyond water. Everybody thinks we're just in the water business, but we're in 911 management, street divisions, billing departments, which I know I get calls about, and we're improving every day. We're listening to you. We're getting there. We're not there, but we're getting there. Y'all, a year ago, we were 6,800 work orders, and now we're well below 3,000 because we came together and said, let's fix this problem. What's the problem? Let's take the hurdles that are internally out of the way, and let's partner with small businesses to help fill the void. Let's do what we do best and find somebody else to do what they do best to help us fill those voids. You know, we're continuing to, to look. We do animal services. We have to build a new animal shelter, folks. It's outdated, it's outplayed, and there are more opportunities for us to get dogs and cats into foster programs and hopefully into adoption than have to go to a kill shelter. And that's what we want to continue to do is invest and do those type of things that make a difference. We're investing in our infrastructure, everything from our meters. You know, we installed over 150,000 new water meters. Some had some challenges, but the majority, almost 95% of those meters that went out are allowing us to share better information with you, the consumer, because we see when leaks are there. We can tell when something's off, and it's helping us make sure that we're providing the best service. Technology, once again, playing a, a role. The, walk, the wait times. We had a call volume at one point of 1,500 calls a day just backing up our call center, frustrating customers who were on the, uh, on the phone and couldn't, couldn't get through. So we got with the staff and said, okay, what can we do? Well, staff's recommendation was, let's move all the people from nights and weekends and focus where the biggest call volume is from eight to, nine, eight to five every day. And let's use a call service to handle the others and then you can push emergency calls forward and get them handled right away. Get billing questions sent right away and get responses. We cut that time down to two minutes. And, and that's a big achievement, but that's listening to our, our employees and, and listening to our customer base on how we address that. You know, we're continuing to work with the different departments to ensure the city has the vibrant enjoyment and efficiency, you know, and, and a lot of that is public safety, police. I'm very proud of our police department, and those of you who are here tonight, thank you for what you do. And I say that out of sincerity because I've, I've been on patrol with them, and I see the volume that they deal with today. 
the volume of calls, and the minute they have to get out of a car every day and be perfect. They have to be perfect because somebody's filming or somebody's doing there, and they're doing it with less people because recruitment is harder and harder than it is today. So we're being creative about that. We're doing some unique things to recruit officers so that we're not just stealing somebody from Lexington or from Spartanburg, but really looking into other areas. How do we bring people here and get them into working with some great individuals? And I want to thank the chief for his commitment. Thank you, chief, for continuing to be committed to our community. Um, I, I still think you're the best hire we had and the police chief, and, and I stand by that. But focusing our strategies, using technology on gun violence, pinning it down, working with our Office of Gun Violence and how we address that and make a plan to work with community activists and other folks in our communities to make sure that we're reducing it, that we're not going 18% up and that we're reducing that and we're using what we know, people, places, and behavior with intervention, prevention, and law enforcement obviously being the last piece of that but using the skill set that we've all learned. Operation Hope and Order, really focusing on downtown, listening to the constituents from down there about dealing with criminal activity, dealing with some of the lawlessness and other things that are happening, but figuring out how we take that, that program but help those folks who are needy and need help. Using our pathway units, so we hired clinicians to work with our police department to go in and really and deal with folks with mental illness challenges and making sure that we can get them and making sure if we can refer them through our homeless services. Both Mackin and Kamisha are here. Y'all raise your hand. These are the folks that are by there working on this day in and day out with our pallet shelters and others. You know, our code enforcement, which is now part of the police department, 8,000 inspections. 20 demolitions of substandard su uh, structures. We got about 40 more to go. We funded that so we can get that done, so we can get these dilapidated homes out of neighborhoods and start building homes back in those neighborhoods. You know, we, we lost about 9% of our population over the last decade, especially in our inner city neighborhoods, and we want to build that back one house at a time. And we're doing that through a project. Um, at the city where we're building, we're starting in the Belmont neighborhood with, with 10 homes in an area where we had some lots that have been empty, but putting home ownership, opportunities for teachers, police officers, city employees, folks graduating from the Housing Authority program to have a place. So continuing to, to make those investments. And um, I'd love to hear from Howard and, and, and Oddity on, on their thoughts. Go ahead. So I, I would just like to echo what the mayor said about the emphasis that this council specifically has placed on improving public safety and supporting our police force, whether it's by creating a uh, incentive plan and pay plan that hopefully recruits the best and the brightest to Columbia, um, or whether it's passing innovative policies and setting the stage for other municipalities to follow our lead. One of the things that we passed uh, was really focused on um, the reporting of lost or stolen firearms. We know that that is often the number one place where people get access to firearms that they shouldn't have and many times result in that violent crime. And because of that, there are other, other um, locations across South Carolina also looking to pass an ordinance of that nature. Um, you know, we are also continuing to look at ways in which we can improve our relationship with our um, neighborhoods. And it's wonderful to see that our police continue to show up at neighborhood meetings to provide updates. They hand out their cell phone number, and that's just standard practice. That's something that they've continued to do to help build those partnerships and to build those authentic relationships to improve trust in our communities. And so we're all ears as we continue to find ways in which we can continue to improve the quality of life and continue to make our neighborhoods more safe. As the mayor probably would agree with me, it's not something that the city can do alone, but we certainly have the tools available, whether it's increased cameras across the city, whether it's you know more of a police presence in areas, but we need your help as well in terms of helping us find those hotspots or those pain points that we can address quickly and efficiently. Thank you, Dr. Bustles. I'd like just to say that I have seen the script that Daniel's working through the night, and it is amazing the, the amount of projects that we've got going on in the city of Columbia. 
uh, we have 117 uh, organized neighborhoods in, in the city, and every time I go out and make, I uh, have a little uh, to-go uh, kit that I take with projects that we are working on at that time, uh, and I start briefing the uh, neighborhood on projects that are that are on tap right at that that particular month. Uh, they are amazed at everything that's going on. When I talk about what's developed on the Saluda River, uh, what's developing on the canal, uh, uh, the people are amazed at all these projects that are going on in the city of Columbia. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the projects that we do without a functioning council. And I want to brag on uh, the six people, I won't brag on myself, but uh, at least six of them are, are working together really well, and I think my, I hope I have contributed something to that. But uh, we have a, a very well-functioning council now and, and proud of what the, uh, Mayor Rickman has been able to do. We wouldn't be able to do that without the superior staff that we have in the city of Columbia. Our staff is top-notch. I have worked with municipal staff for 50 years, and I can say that this staff in the city of Columbia is right at the top of the best. Thank you, Howard. Um, thank you, Oddity, for, for your words. You know, we talked about the Office of Violent Crime. Obviously, we funded and staffed it, and we mentioned about how important working with our police department, taking the data that we have, and, and really getting in there and being the quarterback to bring people together. Because we realize that there are a lot of people doing a lot of great things, but we've got to have a bit larger impact. And our goal is to reduce the shootings. And you, it, it seems like more and more today that gun violence is just the quick answer to what used to be a, a, a schoolyard fight, and we'd move on and carry on. And now people just shoot each other. And so I think a lot of that is is us really getting out there. But we need help from the community too. Um, Seventy percent of the guns that we recover from these are stolen. So let's, let's not leave guns in your car. Let's keep things locked up. Let's do our part to help as a community. But we've also been working, as I mentioned, partnerships. So Richland One's a partnership that we, we struck on the JAG program, the Jobs for American Graduates, that they had in C.A. Johnson. It was the only high school that, that had the program. And this is a program that works with some really challenged kids from their freshman year of high school all the way to their freshman year of college to make sure that they're getting help, that they're getting to class, that they're part of the community, and that the gaps that they have in in, in their learning that there's their help to get it. The governor put a challenge out, the first 25 schools to sign up, he would pay for 75% of the program. Um, so we went and signed up for the additional eight high schools in District 1 and took that slot and then Richland 1 and the City of Columbia are funding the, the back portion, so each of us have put 12.5% in it along with the governor and hopefully that, that, that could change 600 lives. And so when we talk about partnerships, those are the type of things that we're trying to do which improves quality of life and opportunities for folks here. Um, our fire department, we, we wouldn't be here without our fire department. These guys risk their lives every day. They become first responders and they put their lives at risk every day. But they're doing so much. They're, they're inspecting, their fire prevention division is inspecting hundreds of, of buildings every year. They're in there every school. They've installed 225, or 27, excuse me, smoke alarms for citizens. They're, they're, we've approved a second gear for them, so now they have a second set of bunker gear. We're investing in a new uh, fire station. We're investing in our new fire houses. We did it a competitive pay, so now they have a, a competitive pay that puts them on board with everyone else at a level that they can see, and they can see what they're making for the next 10 years out. And why it's important, because if you're wearing a uniform today, we're having to fight to keep you and, and get you in. And I know there are some questions about recruitment and others that we'll get to at the end of the meeting, which I'm excited to talk about, because we're doing some out-of-the-box thinking when it comes to that. Most important, and it's, it's probably one of our top issues, next to roads, homelessness has become one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with in Columbia. And I'm very proud to say that we propped up in a short amount of time, thanks to the city manager and the senior staff. We came to them with a pallet home process, and we put 50 pallet homes up in about 60 days and had it operating in 90 days. 
And since then, we've been able to get almost, I think it's over 30 now, uh, Kamisha, is that right? Over 30 people transitioned from there into permanent housing, but we've been able to refer a lot of other people to other services to make sure they're getting the wraparound services and, and really tackling that unsheltered piece one bite at a time and really doing it with in, intentional to make sure that we're getting people the help they need. Um, we're not there yet, and our, hopefully our goal is to build what we call the Hope Center. And the Hope Center will be a, a community that's focused in having all the services on site. So we're talking about urgent care with physical therapy, dentistry, behavioral, um, I don't want to say science, that's not the right term, but behavioral health, behavioral health thank you. Um, working on having clinicians on site, but also working with the governor to bring all the departments in. We had a meeting with DMH today, it's the fourth meeting we've had with them about services that they can help us with, everything from telemedicine to others to make sure that we're getting people because the, the majority of folks in our unsheltered population, almost 40% that we know of have mental health business or they have addictions. So working with Laredac, but bringing those services to one place that it allows us to actually make sure people are getting the help that they need. And, and it's gonna be so important for us all to be behind it. But you know, services are leaving downtown. DHEC will be moving in the future. So that means that we have to get people, help people to go get their birth certificates and other things that they need for benefits. DMVs are already located in the edges of town and taking folks in and out, but having all those services together where they're available once or twice a week at a site so that we can make sure people get the help that they need. And that's part of our focus because homelessness has grown over the last three years and it's had a major impact on the quality of life of those individuals who are homeless because they're in a situation that's not safe, but it's also having an impact on residents and businesses. And we're a very compassionate city. There are 103 different types of services available to homeless in our community and about $40 million a year spent on different homeless services but we're not reducing it, so we gotta try something different. Um, Dr. Bussels ran our homeless task force and had great input, and we're trying to take those, those initiatives and one step at a time try to make a difference in that. Did you wanna add something to that? Absolutely, so I would say that one of the things that we learned through that process, and it was a very intentional process of bringing together our business owners and citizens, but then also engaging our providers, those who have already been doing this work and finding those gaps in terms of some of the issues that we continue to see. So one of the biggest I think pieces of feedback that we often got from you all when in our entertainment districts was that there was nowhere to call after 5 p.m. And that was something we really pushed our partners on. What, what are we doing after 5 p.m.? You know, homelessness doesn't end you know, at 5 p.m. There has to be options. So one of the things that the city has done with our homeless services team is we do have outreach and then we're working with other outreach uh, specialists across different partners that we have to try and engage that hard to reach population and hopefully get them the resources that they need. One of the biggest issues, and I'll be real with you all, is the rates of refusal. People are still refusing to engage in these services and we have plenty of different options available. And that's gonna continue to be a challenge as we have to build those relationships. We're dealing with trauma, we're dealing with addiction, um, we're, de we're dealing with a lot of different factors and the city can't do it alone. And so one of the things that I have encouraged our citizens to do is to, to make sure that you let people know that the rapid shelter is an option that's available. It is something that is low barrier and it requires a referral, but it's very easy to do. And we can get folks plugged in into living with dignity in a single occupancy space, which oftentimes works much better than that traditional shelter model, right? And then in terms of what we're looking at in the future, in addition to that Hope Center, we're looking at ways in which the city can continue to lead on some of these efforts where it comes to really having accountability across the different services that are available. Maybe reaching out to our, our federal partners and seeing if there's innovating, innovative funding that's available to help support some of these efforts. It's not gonna change overnight, but just know that we are looking at the root causes of why homelessness exists in Columbia, and there's no one answer that's gonna help solve the problem. Howard, do you wanna add anything? 
I don't think I'll have to add anything. Dr. Bussels and Mayor have covered it. I think that this is a national problem, not just a Columbia problem, and we have to be careful uh, not to accept more responsibility than is due for the city of Columbia when it is a statewide problem caused by defunding of services to uh, mental health, drugs, and everything else. So the state needs to step up and handle the funding for this. Which is very true, but we're going to continue to, to push to lead and bring people to the table because partnerships are what drive it, and that's why we've been meeting with with the interim director of DMH and his staff and other folks, uh, our healthcare systems and others to bring people to partner. This is a community issue and we, we're gonna have to drive it together as a community, but we can't just sit back idly on our hands and just continue to do what we're doing. We gotta make a difference. And I think it's, it's very important that we continue to do that as, as a council and as a city and, and excited that we have an opportunity to do it and people want a partnership. Collaboration seem to be the trend and I think when we show that collaboration, federal money will open up because the one thing I've learned after all these trips up into Washington, uh, trying to shake the federal tree for money is, is that collaboration is the key word and how are you collaborating with other folks in your region to make a difference and so we'll continue to do that. But collaboration just segues us into talking about expanding our access to the river, you know, with our parks and working together to, to open up that river. And when you look at it, the 200 acres that we talked about earlier with Dominion that opened it up, ties us into the Irmo Recreation Commission with what they're doing, bringing access from the dam all the way down. It's gonna turn us into uh, a tourist destination similar. We hear so much about other cities and their trails and how they connect. Well, here we have an opportunity down the road that you'll be able to go from downtown all the way to the dam on foot or by bike and make your way across over to Elmwood Park, cut over and go over to Enda Coffee or over to Warmouth and have lunch. And if you get a stomach ache, you can continue the trail over to Richland Memorial, check into the e e ER, get fixed up, get back on your bike and head back downtown for dinner. But the connectivity is our recruiting tool. It's what people are looking for. Uh, when we talk to our young folks, we have a council of, of, of college, collegiate engagement. And part of that was stemmed from us asking kids, why aren't you staying here after college? Why are you leaving? Well, housing was a big part of that. These young folks wanna live in our downtown. They don't wanna live in a house anymore. They don't wanna buy a house in Shandon or Rosewood or Cottontown or anywhere. They wanna live in a tower with amenities. They wanna shut their door and they wanna walk to work. They wanna walk to services and walk to entertainment. They want the inner city feel. And that's where we see the growth in places like Charlotte and South Boulevard is because that's what they're providing. That's what we're recruiting for. How do we get more of that? But also cross-pollinating our campuses. I probably spent more time in the last two years at Allen and Benedict working with Dr. Artist and others about making sure that we're cross-pollinating our campuses. And part of what I heard from the kids is, is they want to have relationships with students at other campuses. But they also don't know what each other are doing. So opening those communication lines, University of South Carolina did a great thing this past year for home, last year's homecoming. They gave 2,000 tickets to the other colleges and universities to their homecoming concert for their students to invite those, and they got used up. Kids were working together. Students were sharing ideas and having a social. We did, uh, we did the first right before uh, summertime. We're gonna do another one this fall where we had the collegiate side side hustle these kids who have their their own little business if it's jewelry making or whatever giving them a half a block at soda city so they could sell their stuff but it was a way for the kids to come together and share ideas and show what their talents are and it's opened up a lot of relationships kids now looking that are graduating from benedict or going to law school at the University of South Carolina. They're taking advantage of graduate programs at CIU and others. The kids are doing it because we're showing them. The other thing we learned from them that was so important was the fact that those kids didn't understand all the opportunities here, and that's on us. Not marketing and not sharing, not introducing them to the business community. So the new dean has made a commitment to work with us to do that, and I'm so excited about that opportunity. 
But all of that stems into economic development and why they want to be here. William Street Extension is a great example. For 15 years, we've been talking about the Ginyards property and how to connect it and how to work. We're so excited to, to work with that family and open up and with now that we have funding to build the connectivity road, that grows the commercial. So if we can grow the commercial and the residential in there, that's money that then we can capture and use to maintain and put forth to a park. Once again, a partnership with Dominion. Dominion is giving us all the rock. As of this week, they're finished with the coffer dams. They're done in the river. It's cleaned up, approved. All that rock and everything is now being used to fill up the shoreline and using to fill up gaps. That will help us build the base so that we can connect the trail and hopefully future have a nice riverfront park with more access to the river, both for kayakers, for, for hikers, for bikers, and for those who just want to have a beautiful view of what I think is one of our greatest assets, the river. But we couldn't do that if we didn't all our apartments work together. You know, so we go from parks and recs, we go to economic development, they all tie in together, but public works that's completed so many initiatives, and uh, I don't think Robert's here tonight, uh, Robert Anderson, uh, head of public works, but they're continuing to improve and do things to improve our community, investing in our forestry, looking at pilot programs. We, we're we're going to plant, I think, $336,000 worth of trees this year, working with partnerships to maintain with not only DOT, but garden clubs and others to bring back those beautiful medians and get sustainable planning in there so that when people come through our community that it's a good reflection instead of a tomato plant and a weed being in the middle of Gervais Street. That's not who we are. But doing that together, you know, um, I think with the, we talked a little bit about the animal shelter and we received a $100,000 grant to continue to help us to get to the no-kill, but what it's made us realize is that we need to invest in the new facility and that's one of our, our capital programs that we will be looking to work with the private sector and unique uh, um, financing and do something out of the box. I'm very proud to say that, that Columbia, South Carolina is the only city in South Carolina that achieved gold lead status by the U.S. Green Building, and that's a reflection in our community. It's a big deal. I had an opportunity to go to Washington to present uh, at the U.S. Building Conference, and we were one of 16 cities across the nation that received that status. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for economic development. It's a big deal for recruitment. And it's a big deal that we are being conscious of our environment and planning for the future. This is really about our grandkids and their kids. So you know, the more that we do, and I want to thank all the folks at our public works who painstakingly went through that process. It's not an easy process. And that's why it's a big deal. And I'm proud that we're number one in <laughs> South Carolina. Did, Howard, did you want to add or, or audit anything to that? I, I would just like to tag on to William Street. I think the, um, the putting William Street between uh, Gervais and Blossom it'll, will be a great stimulus for development along the river. Uh, probably 20 years ago when the university first put out their uh, vision of what could happen between the campus now and the river, they were moving towards the river. Uh, and I saw all the buildings that they had planned and projects they had planned. I went home, I was still working at that time, and told Allianne, that's where we're going to retire. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't quite get built fast enough, so I just got as far as Senate Street instead of William <laughs> Street. <laughs> but I'm moving, in the, I'm moving in the right direction, and I might go down to, Gervais, uh, to William Street later on. Which you know brings us to why projects are so important and why we're leveraging every opportunity at the federal level. We hired consultants to help us go after grants because all the, a lot of the federal money and a lot of people don't understand, it's not formula based, it's application based. So we have to be very intentional about our applications and leveraging those and being creative, listening to. We didn't get a mega grant, but we went back and met with the staff. Well, what do we need to do and better? So we've applied back. Well, one of those projects for us, which I think is very important in our downtown, is working with the railroad. Since 1905, there was a book written about the modernization of Columbia, and there were two things in there that stood out to me. One was the relocation of rail <laughs> downtown and, and Finley Park. 
that those were the two big things that we needed a central park. Well, we got that, and we're rebuilding that, but what we don't have is a relocation. And so elevating those rail tracks on Rosewood and Assembly Street, along with 15 different closings, y'all, we have 60 crossings in our community. We have more crossings than any other city in South Carolina. And why is this important? Well, one, it cuts off a neighborhood, both from a safety standpoint and an equity standpoint. You know, number two, between the inlet port and our port and its increased growth with our automotive industry that's coming through, rail traffic is increased somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, and they believe it's going to exceed 50 to 60 percent because of the growth in these industries. And so we're going to see more traffic. It's great for our sister cities in the upstate and the low country because they, they see that we're just the travel point. So investing and, and working with, we've received over $40 million from the state. We're applying for the Infra, the Mega, the Chrissy, every grant known to man to go over this project that we've actually been working on as a community for two decades. Engineering's done working with the railroad about what, what they're going to pull. All of these things have been worked on for so long, but we haven't been able to get it over the hump. We have an opportunity with this historic funding through the, the programs that are there to do it. It's our time. And why this is so important and why I think we have an opportunity to do something with one, we've been talking about it for 120 years and I'm ready to put this project to bed. But two, it's the only project in the state of South Carolina that has ever gone to the federal government with the state, local, neighboring communities, the entire congressional delegation, I'm talking about the whole state, Congress and Senate, the governor, the universities, mayors from the surrounding counties and cities all signed on in a letter of support for this project. It made a major impact because that's how other cities get things done. And this monumentally will change downtown for Columbia if we can get it done. And we're going to keep pushing hard on the mega and the infra. We're going to continue to get there. But just part of that is, is relocation, but the next step for that is the quiet zones, which means spending up to $13 million on 14 grade crossings to improve the security in the crossover of that, because if we can do that, that eliminates that horn that you hear in the middle of the night and early in the morning through our downtown neighborhoods. That improves the quality of life. And those are the things that we're pushing forward through grants and, and uh, op funding opportunities from the state. And I want to thank uh, Senator Harpoolian because he's been a driver on the quiet zones. It might have something to do that he hears the horn more than most people, but for whatever reason it is, we're very grateful that he wants to work with us to do it. So as we continue to drive those community improvements, a lot of it is around basic services, but also opening up and taking away any barriers for safety. And I think that's important. I think the next piece for us really is, is talking about neighborhoods and communities, the heart of our city, Finley Park, you know, our crown jewel, $24 million in reinvestment, and what's important about it is a lot of people say, well, how are you going to deal with the safety? How are you going to deal with the maintenance? Well, I'm going to be honest with you, we didn't do a good job with that in the past. We did not. But the difference is, is now we're doing what we learned from all our other parks. We're activating the park. We're having park rangers who are stationed there and part of the day-to-day -day life seven days a week, along with having maintenance crews and everything where people are engaged in that park. What else has changed? Our downtown living's increasing. We have more people living in our downtown corridor who are looking for that outdoor piece to have exercise, relaxation, but activating the park. New water features, new trails, but also an amphitheater that can do everything from concerts to plays. It was designed correctly. It's designed into the hill. So it reflects out and you can take advantage of all the beautiful grass in the setting, but it allows us to bring a whole lot of different experiences to our residents downtown. And that's what people are looking for. Once again, three major highways, we are located where people want to come. So let's give them the things that we can do 
do and, and give them more chances to be here socially, culturally, and hopefully invest. And God bless them. Please move here. We'd love to have you. Hyatt Park made major investments, over 350000 in baseball, outdoor basketball, and mural donation from Asia Wilson, an athlete who sells Columbia all the time. She's been the MVP two years in a row, high scorer during the playoffs. But I will tell you one thing, she gives back to this community. And every time we've asked her to do something to help us, especially when it comes to neighborhoods and youth, she's been there. And um, I wish she was here, that we could thank her. I know we're going to do an event at Parks and Rec's Foundation honoring her. Um, for her work, but she continues to find ways. And what's great about it is that we've applied through grants so that we can get some more outdoor exercise facilities to do one in each district. And we're partnering up to build these outdoor platforms so that we can have more exercise opportunities. Because our goal is to be a blue zone. With If you don't know what a blue zone is, a blue zone is where we have people living up to 100 years old. We're extending their lives. We're going to do an assessment. You'll be part of that assessment. Richland Memorial Hospital Board's going to fund that study. And we're going to figure out how we do that, how we improve the quality of life here. But we also came out of that as Nancy Lieberman, who was the first female coach in the NBA former national championship coach in the WNBA, has a program too, and I met her and I told her about what we were doing with Asia, and now she wants to come here and bring us another court in a challenged neighborhood and be part of that because she said, if I didn't have a public court to play on when I was a kid, I would have never been in the seat where I am today. So her goal is to give back to every community she can through her foundation. And so we're looking forward to having that announcement here before long. We're investing in those parks with technology so that, that our residents and kids have an opportunity to have access to computers and continue to, to learn and get tutoring and being part of our parks, truly being a center of the community. We had free sports clinics for over 500 youth. We had summer, uh, summer camps, 1,400 youth were involved in that, trying to make a difference. After school programs at five city parks. We have senior post programs for seniors through our trips, bingo, and aerobics, <laughs> uh, and special events. But we're doing things to engage people and be part of that, and that's part of what we want to do. And then obviously our efforts to revitalize neighborhoods. We, we, we propped up a Love Your Grant blocks. Twelve neighborhoods use that to clean up and revitalize, planting plants, fixing their trees. You know, we had 130 units and 20 homes repaired through our community block grant. Boyd Foundation. Uh, if, you, if you ever run into Mrs. Boyd or, or George and Fort Bailey or any of the family members, take the time to thank them. Because what they're doing in our community is incredible. They're spending millions of dollars to improve the quality of life in our city, if it's on the river, if it's downtown at the Hampton Preston building, a mansion with their, their outdoor facility that they built, the gardens there that they've invested into, the incubator. They put a million dollars in an incubator where we're growing businesses and giving opportunities and attracting tech companies here. They're being on the forefront. They've committed to two bridges on our riverfront when the canal gets replaced and out um, on the other side of Boyd Island. I forgot what we call that little trek. The, the, broad, river, the broad River is going to have a, a bridge across it paid for by the Boyd Foundation, and that's been permitted and getting ready to, they've gotten the money to do it. They're also putting in a bridge at the hydro plant next to the State Museum that will connect the area around the State Museum to the canal when it's finished and give us con con connectivity all the way to Boyd Island. They paid for Boyd Island. Boyd Island's a very special place. Dedication on the 30th of September coming up. October. October, October. excuse me, October. By the way, Daniel, I like that blue zone and living to 100 bit. I'm going to vote for that one. We're going to try. We actually have a blue zone here. It's interesting because I went to visit uh, a lady to celebrate her 105th birthday over at Pruitt Health, which is right off um, Taylor in, in Forest Drive. And uh, I sat next to a lady who was 105 who was very chatty. 
and next to her was a lady who was 100 years old, and the lady next to her was 99, and the three ladies across the table were 95. I didn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> um, but it was all in one place, so I know that we're headed down the right track. Obviously, we're continuing to invest and partner. This is where collaboration comes in, but investing in food insecurity, it's a problem in our community, and trying to address it through, through different programs but not repeat mistakes that we've seen in the past. So we funded a, a mobile market that will be going in, uh, hopefully in the spring, uh, which will be delivering fresh groceries and opportunities with a local farmer uh, here. Uh, and it will have everything from eggs, milk, butter, um, uh, fresh vegetables, fruit. Obviously, Tom's Creek is located, located here. But we're also trying something monumental. It's actually going to be, hopefully, um, it's going to turn into a national model with Instacart, which is taking advantage of technology, as we talk about. So we're working a program through grants to provide free delivery to folks impacted by food insecurity. And we're going to start with folks on Medicaid and Medicare as a start because we, can, we have that information and we can get them in. And working with them, those folks who don't have tablets or may not have banking, we got a banking partner who wants to help them create what they need for bank accounts, and ATM cards, credit cards, so that they can use that, so they can order their groceries when they want to. Providing tablets to those folks who don't have it and teaching them how to do this program, but making it free and you get to pick your grocery store. This model is a very exciting. Uh, Instacart is very excited to be it. We're gonna have a huge announcement here at the end of the month uh, with them launching it. And it started off with us initially saying, let's pilot it with 10,000. That money's already increased and we're getting money from other sources. People wanna be part of it. Because technology can heal, help fill a void without risking. And, and, and I say that as just in Spartanburg County, they just spent another $900 million to refurbish a grocery store to bring somebody in, and within 12 months it closed. And this, what, the, what you don't want to have is a grocery store to close in an area twice. Because once it's done that, it'll never be a grocery store again. And we can't afford that anywhere in town. We've got to make sure when we make that investment, when we partner with somebody, that it's going to be successful so that we don't go backwards, we only go forwards. Did you want to add anything to the food insecurity? I just wanted to say that I think the um, mayor should toot his horn a little bit more about this. You know, this was an issue that came up a lot uh, in terms of when we were um, campaigning. The, the inconsistency and lack of access to uh, fresh and whole foods and it's easy to say that we just need to build a new grocery store right and um, for us it's a very emotional thing to see injustice and people not have access to those those resources but for grocery stores it's often about the bottom line and so to be able to work around some of these existing challenges and partner with a, you know, I would say a pretty young company like Instacart that has really revolutionized grocery uh, pickups, especially during COVID and now um, for those that may not be able to go to the grocery store, I think is pretty incredible. And so I think we uh, are very excited to continue to think about ways in which we can work around some of those obstacles of maybe not being able to get something immediately like a large grocery store, but still being able to provide access in an innovative way. I, th I think the uh, mobile market that, that's coming in in January, 1st of February, is going to be a really big hit. Uh, we're going to partner with our parks and recreation to give it a space to park in. We're going to do what the mayor would call wraparound services uh, with the uh, food truck, uh, and that they will have be able to do health things, uh, exercise things, uh, sign up for programs. So I think that's going to be a, a big hit when it gets off the ground. And we're going to continue to invest. When we made a commitment in our strategic planning uh, as a council, we said we wanted to invest in the city. We want to invest in our employees. We want to continue to invest in our parks, our infrastructure, and make it the best place. And that has the biggest impact on our citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, we talked about market salary adjustments we've done, step up plans for both the police and the fire, leadership development and employee training very important. We need to invest in our future. And we have so many talented employees and giving them an opportunity to advance themselves is very important. And we're going to continue to do that. Improving our technology. 
you know, using technology to solve problems. We have to think differently today. We can't continue to provide service and support the way we have in the past. It can't just be manpower. We got to use technology that's out there to make sure that we're delivering the best services. And then obviously our big focus this year too is consolidating city offices. We are going to consolidate multiple and we're going to put up about 15 to 17 properties to be sold and put back on the, uh, on the tax roll. And consolidating is a good thing for, for multiple reasons. A, we get pieces out there back on the tax roll, but we actually get our employees and our departments working closer together, communicating more, which brings in better efficiencies. It allows them to collaborate better and improve the quality of life. Everything we're doing is trying to improve the quality of life here in our community and make Columbia the number one city. We want to be a role model for everyone else, and we're continuing to lead by stepping outside the box and trying different things. We are going to fail some folks, I'm gonna be honest with you. It's okay, it's what we learn from that and how we improve and move forward. We're not scared to try something. And then obviously our last piece is economic development. We've had an incredible year in development, close to $600 million. Our hospitality and visiting districts are growing. As I mentioned earlier, we're on the road in Charlotte, Charleston, Atlanta, Greenville, meeting with people at their doorsteps, talking to these restaurateurs and these retailers, meeting with housing and development folks, helping us figure out how to fill those voids. We have five new hotels coming, five new multifamily in three different city districts. Um, just met with some folks the other day, probably going to have two more announced. I mean, we're going to have close to $2 billion worth of construction happening in this community over the next 24 months. And that's because people see Columbia as an opportunity, a great place to live. And as we increase our downtown living, taking advantage of these empty parking lots and these empty city blocks and putting buildings on there with people who are here to work, play, and invest and be part, those folks going to the theater, making sure that they're taking part in our community. I'm so excited about it. But we're actively recruiting. And I say that we're doing something different. We're going to them and not waiting for them to come to us. We are telling our story. And I think it's so important because we have so much to share and tell. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Howard? Well, I, I, I think uh, one of the things that I like to look at is COLA today. If you look at the COLA today on Thursday or Friday where they list all the events that are going to happen on the weekend, it makes you tired reading the list. I mean, it, we've got a lot of things happening every weekend, and sometimes, uh, um, like the Jerry Garcia Sunday at uh, Five Points, I had some of my old folks in where I live uh, complaining about the noise, and I said, you must not be a deadhead. <laughs> <laughs> And they, I should, would, they should have gone down there. And I would just add that if our enthusiasm um, for economic development isn't enough, one of the things that we've also been pushing is to make it easier to start a business here in Columbia. That was something that um, was really important to all of us. So whether it's moving our business licensing online to having a business liaison that's dedicated to helping you kind of navigate how to even engage the city for the different permits and things that you need to open a business to you know our different programs to help uplift uh, an existing business. These are all things that we're trying to actively promote and help those who maybe have never opened a business here be able to do so easily. You don't have to know someone to be successful here. That's the goal. You should be able to come here with a dream and be able to bring it to life. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, Ryan Coleman is here from our economic development office, and I've been dragging him all over the place doing ribbon cuttings and working with, but he's, he is working with businesses and helping them navigate. We've got more compliments from people saying it's so much easier to do business here that y'all made it easier to get permits. Krista Hampton and her team went through and figured out how we can get people through the pipeline quicker and faster. Time is money for folks. And when you're a small business, that, that's a lifetime of money. So everything that we can do, our business-friendly initiatives that we put forth, our staff is following through with that and getting it done. And, and I just think it, it shows that everybody is working together as a team to get things done. Obviously, Bull Street is, is growing leaps and bounds. It's changed it a little bit, as y'all remember. Uh, it was supposed to be 80 retail and this and that. Now it's becoming more housing office space, smaller restaurant, but it's filling up, it's growing. 
Um, and, and I think that's, that's a testimony to folks realizing that maybe the path we were headed down wasn't headed the right way. Robert Hughes, young Robert, who is running the show now, has just done an incredible job. I love when I see his name come across my phone because it's usually great news. <laughs> But he's also saying, hey, will you talk to these folks? Will you tell them about Columbia? Nobody sells it better than you. And we've gone to different meetings with folks together to bring different options in entertainment to the district and really bring it where it encompasses and grows. And, and we have to think about that because the success there is going to be important as we think about planning when DHEC moves out of downtown. And we have a whole nother 50 to 60 acres to be thinking about in a core center of our community, how we're gonna to work together to, to grow and fill that space with the right development to enhance and support our community in our historic neighborhoods downtown. Scout Motors, I mentioned it earlier. Folks, this is probably one of the best things that can happen to us. We have an opportunity to be part of the automotive industry but also benefit from the leadership. If you've seen what's happened in the upstate with BMW, and what's great about it is some of the leadership at Scout, especially on the governing board, are folks that were part of BMW in the beginning, folks that lived there in 1985 when everything started to happen, who were there at the plant growth. And what really excited me is when I had an opportunity to talk to the Chattanooga mayor, and I said, tell me about VW as a partner. He said, they're invested in our community, our youth, our cultural, our restaurants, they do everything to be part of a community. They're living in our neighborhoods, they're attending our schools, they're supporting our art programs. And here's the other thing. He said, if you look at their history, they've never closed a plant that they've opened. When they're in, they're in. And I think that's a testimony and it says a lot. And I'm excited about what they're gonna bring and the spinoffs that's gonna come with that and the technology, the opportunity for the 65,000 young people in our community, our military retirement folks, who have an opportunity to take an incredible job, which is a huge population for us. The general told me the other night that seven out of 10 families that are retiring at Fort Jackson now are choosing Columbia as their home. And he wants to figure out how we welcome them more to the community. That is a built-in workforce. We have something that the upstate and the low country don't have. We have those students and those military families who are gonna make a big difference in our future workforce, not only with Scout, but Battery and some of the other programs that you're seeing that are gonna come downtown. And I think that's exciting. Adding to that, I have to say that the new dean is working with us to embrace all the graduates. Where are those graduates in their, their careers? The MIBS program graduates, we have so many there in C-suites. We're going to see them, and we're gonna tug on their emotional coat a little bit and say, we have an urban city, we want your back office, we want your cyber units, we want your subsidiaries. You went to school there, you know our community, you know the workforce we have, come with us and let's build something together. Let's bring part of your company here and let's create more job opportunities so we can keep all this talent that we have in. So partnerships are a key. Um, obviously, we've had a tremendous amount of new business licenses, new businesses, not just renewals, but new businesses, small, large, and medium in our city. I think this year alone, we've had over 950 new business licenses. That's a testimony of what we're doing is working and people want to be here because people are moving not just for the ease of doing business, but the quality of life and the character of the community. Quality of life and character of the community plays a much larger role today in recruitment than anything else. People are making that about where they intentional of where they're living. It's not just job driven. You talk to these young people, they're picking cities and areas before they have a job. It's about they want the quality of life. Well, so do other folks today. So balancing that and continuing to improve that is important. Obviously, our Office of Business Opportunity, our economic development team work to enhance 
Dr. Bussell's mentioned small existing and new businesses. They're helping people figure out how they start a business, figuring out those traps, making sure that the things they are doing put them on a path to success and they can take advantage of any federal, state, or local program, if it's tax incentives, employment tax credits, or, or anything from facade grants to small business loan applications, they're there to help. I mean, they've, they've I think, met with over 5,000 of our local business owners through workshops and events. They hosted our small, this year was our 10th annual, I believe, 10th annual small business conference, and they touch points with about 212 small businesses. But we've done close to 70 ribbon cuttings. What's exciting about the ribbon cuttings, this last month was the biggest month we've ever had, and the majority of them were women-owned businesses. So I know we're doing the right thing, and I know that we're doing that because people want to have a ribbon cutting today. They're proud to say that they're in Columbia, South Carolina, but they'll also tell you that our staff at OBO and Economic Development and, and our staff across the city has made them feel welcome and part of the community and the neighborhoods have embraced them. And I think that, once again, another testimony of what we have here in Columbia, South Carolina. Do you want to add anything, either one of you? Um, I was glad that you were out of town when they opened up the pickleball shop in Five Points. I got to open, I got to cut that ribbon uh, for the pickleball equipment. Are you playing yet? I'm not play, playing yet, but I'm thinking about it seriously. But you're so excited for someone biggest, who doesn't play. The biggest advocate, we, <laughs> the reason we jumped on pickleball is because Howard kept pounding and pounding. We got we to gotta get caught up with the other. And then we found out he doesn't even play. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I would add a growing that, sport. But. <laughs> I would just add it's been incredible to see the diversity of businesses open up as well. I mean, I think this past month you had several different cuisines come to our entertainment district, um, many of which that are owned by millennials or the next generation of business owners, which is very exciting to see more people plant their roots here. And then, so I'm going to run through, talk a little bit about some, some of the projects in District 4 that we've, and a lot of major Columbia water projects approved and completed, you know, Forest Acres Water Service Improvement Phase 1, that was a $3 million investment. Garden Springs Sewer Service, $3 million. Penn Branch Stream Stabilization, that's $6 million. And very a key to what we learned from the 2015 flooding and how we need to address it with all the growth that we're seeing in our community. Obviously, we've begun uh, road improvements in Wood Creek Farms in the entranceway. We just found out that we own a portion of a road that we didn't know, so we're working on improving that, that, that piece. We only own 600 feet of it, but we're going to fix it. Um, but continuing to work on, especially with DOT, addressing a lot of our roads. And for those of you who don't know, that we have 492 miles worth of roads in Columbia. 72% of them are owned by DOT. And for a long time, there was this hesitation to work with us on being creative and trying different things. Uh, and now we're getting to the point where that relationship is, is growing strong. And we're looking, hopefully, in the spring to launch a slowdown uh, neighborhood zone, so moving it to 25 miles an hour across the city in all neighborhoods, looking at trying different bump outs, asphalt art, 3D, a whole lot of different traffic calming. Um, I'm still not giving up on trying to get speed cameras and red light cameras. Um, the legislature has continued to not support that, but the evidence is behind it. Um, if we could have those kind of tools in our school zones, our work zones, and eventually in our neighborhoods, we really could slow that down. And we can do it. It doesn't have to be a criminal penalty. We make it a, a civil penalty. But we got to get the folks slowing down and being more conscious. We have more people being outside. We've got more kids playing around, and we've got to get people focused on driving. And you know, say to Georgia, just went to no texting. You can't text and stuff. And think we've got to start thinking aggressively because literally every time I'm at a stoplight, I can tell when somebody's on their phone because they're not moving. And, and then you see them pop up and hit the gas real hard. <laughs> and you know, unfortunately. But it also takes, a, to be quite honest, it takes a lot. 
average accident for our police officers is an hour and a half worth of time and effort. Just think if we could reduce the accidents, the service calls by our first responders, our fire department who are having to go there, the wear and tear on those trucks, all these things that could be prevented by using technology to enforce our existing laws. So we're going to continue to do that. Obviously, you know, beautification projects on Garner's Ferry, a lot of people talking about that. But we really, clean up is our next real beautification and clean up. We're working on some creative programs with our staff and some community partners to, to really push the clean up program. Because I've got to tell you, when you drive in some of our gateways, the trash, the weeds, the other thing, it is not who we are as a community. Um, and we've got to address it. And partnering, we've done some gateway cleanups too with DOT, but that was us in the county investing in it. And I know a lot of y'all probably read uh, about the penny sales tax. I would be in favor of a penny sales tax under this condition. That a third of it goes to the transit system, a third of it goes to the city of Columbia, and a third of it goes to county for roads and sidewalks only. If I had that type of funding, I could fix every road in Columbia in a decade. It's $180 million worth of, and we've already looked at it. We're trying to figure out how we bite that elephant, but we are not getting funded by the state. The state is not providing us funding for maintenance of their roads, so we've got to be creative. We're getting very little there, and I think if we can do that, that buys us 20 years, and then we can stockhold that money and continue to invest, but I still got neighborhoods and school areas that don't have sidewalks. I got roads that are, are in ill repair and continue, we can patch all we want, but the reality is that they need to be resurfaced and repaved. This would be an opportunity for us to try white surfacing on it as well. So those roads that are, are fairly well maintained, we can seal coat it and create reflectivity. Y'all, we have a heat map study done and we're 18% hotter because of all the asphalt and the roads that we have. That brings down cooling that's better for health. And these are simple things we can do while we're doing road repair. And so we're going to have some lively discussions down the road about the penny, but I think the only way to do it is if we know it's going to the specific, not trying to pick out projects that, we, that run over costs. Focus on what we need to provide. The number one complaint we get is roads. Number one complaint. Uh, did y'all want to add anything to that? You did it. Uh, um, and then obviously we're continuing to, to invest in, the, in our parks, in our, our neighborhoods. Mays Park is getting an $850,000 uh, redo this year with pickleball courts, I might add, uh, coming. Um, we're very excited about that, that project and the revitalization of a key neighborhood. Obviously, we've begun on uh, educational, environmental educational center at Southeast Park. Obviously, still wanting to do some more improvements there, bathrooms and other things to enhance that part. It's getting more use than we've ever seen. A lot of it has to do with the pickleball. A lot of it has to do with tennis. Obviously, uh, Love Our Block grant went to South Meadowfield neighborhood. They improved their community. Neighborhood cleanups hosted in Forest Hills and Cross Hill with support for our community. But we got to do more. We got to continue to invest, planting those trees, fixing up our medians, continuing to take our other parks and investing in them and improving them as a place that's not only a safe haven, but a place that families can enjoy and be part of in the community. Um, economic development, we talked about. We talked about a lot. There's a lot going on in this corridor, and I hope there's a lot more. You know, uh, we, we've had, we've seen a lot of coffee places popping up, but I want to see some more businesses pop up. I want to see some more retail and others, and part of our recruitment is taking the numbers of the volumes that these stores are doing and showing people where that is. How do we enhance everything from Cross Hill all the way up to Cedar Terrace and take advantage of the growth that we're seeing that way, but the reinvestment that we're seeing in, that, in that, those neighborhoods. The Fisher House that happened at, at, at um, Veterans is bringing all types of veteran families in as they're getting treatment and having help. Why is that important? Because it's showcasing our city. It's showcasing what we have. So cleaning up that corridor, investing in that corridor. 
And then obviously, you know, we have uh, a major six, $66 million project, hotel, multifamily, and restaurant. I just heard that out on Garner's Ferry, there's a big piece of property coming up for sale. Three hotels want to locate on that. That means more visitors are coming. That means more people are spending dollars and they're staying over in Columbia, which is a good thing. That means Fort Jackson is getting back up. That means, you know, they bring 250,000 families to our community, 45,000 recruits. $6.7 billion worth of economic impact. So enhancing that gateway, enhancing the amenities that are around there to keep those families and those visitors coming to Columbia, spending their dollars, seeing their loved ones and being proud. And then, um, you want to add anything to any of that? What, what, uh, what I saw and what you just went through is the, the, how large the city of Columbia is. Spears Creek Road, halfway to Camden, is in the city of Columbia, and a lot of those projects that uh, the mayor just went through are on Spears Creek Road. Uh, parts of uh, all the way up to past Irmo are in the city of Columbia. It, it is a big geographical area, and it's very important that we recognize how big it is when we're talking about uh, police coverage, fire coverage, and economic development that has to be spread out over a very large geographical area. We're going to continue to work, as we said, improving, but we can't do it. We're, we're, we're just one piece of the puzzle. So I'd like y'all to look under your seat. Uh, there's, a, there's something under your seat if you'll grab it. Don't be shy. It doesn't bite. It's a piece of the puzzle. You're part of the puzzle that completes us as a city. And if you notice a puzzle, it has multiple pieces and points and it connects. So we've adopted this idea that we're all gonna be a part of the puzzle. So I ask you when you leave, do you wanna be the colored side, active, be real part of the community and do things, make suggestions, correct us when we make mistakes, Invest in our community by spending dollars, being social, being positive, talking about the great things to your friends, neighbors, and cousins? Or do you want to be the black side, the, 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 the I guess you call it cardboard side, <laughs> where you're, 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 just, you're just there? I think I want to be part of this side. I want to be active. I want to be part of the puzzle. And I, what I realize and what I've learned through the last 18 months is that we're all part of the puzzle. We're all part of the pieces and we're only collectively as strong as we are all connected. So I ask you when you leave here today to think about what you're going to do to be part of the puzzle. How are, how are you going to take your piece and improve your neighborhood, your community, and how involved are you going to be? Now, we did have some questions. And surprise, surprise, my dear friend Jim Reed had a whole bunch of them. Um, I know, Jim, you, you, you asked about recruitment and you had talked to some folks. Um, probably a year ago or two years ago, we did lose people to other agencies. But now we're, we probably have the most competitive pay plan there is. Uh, take home cars, training opportunities, and quite frankly, the best police chief there is and the best command staff there is. And uh, um, I will tell you today, we're not losing officers, we're gaining officers. But we're still short. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. We're being creative. We, we're to sent gift baskets in the winter to the coldest cities and thing to their police departments, showing them how warm and nice Columbia is and how they could move here. We're recruiting differently, and what we've learned is just recruiting locally, all we're doing is stealing from each other. Sheriff sees it, the sheriff in Lexington, uh, around the state, Corrections is doing it. We're working together to try things differently. Um, going, taking advantage of some of our, our, our officers who are from Buffalo and other places, using their contacts, using a national marketing firm to help us get more applications in. The more applications we get in, the better quality candidates to get more opportunity we have to recruit. At the same time, we also have to be realistic. We're not the only ones doing that. So investing in the technology and the training and the things to improve pushing our legislator to give these guys the tools and the technology that they need to do their job, but also don't make them keep arresting the same people five times. 
you know, we got to improve the judicial system because right now you hear, the, you, you hear the police chief talk about it, you hear the sheriff talk about it, you hear other folks talking about we've got to change the way our judicial system. I'm all about people getting second chances, but when you got 41 counts and you've been arrested multiple, multiple times, and then you get let off on leniency by a judge and two days later you get arrested again, we don't need that. We're just, we're just putting the same people in. We are taxing the talented officers that we have and we gotta show that support. That's where y'all can help. Y'all can help there. Um, recruitment and retain, as we said, trying different things, going to different places, selling the quality of life we have, but also the pay opportunity because when you're talking about pay, people just look at the base pay, they just look at this, but they don't understand the value of the benefits that we provide. Uh, a lot of people in other cities don't understand take-home cars, that's a big deal. Charlotte has no take-home cars. This is a benefit, but also the opportunities to work all these events. Because we're a capital city, we have all these events, there's opportunities for officers to make money and, and, and do that by working different events from Soda City to football games. So it really has an opportunity for them to increase pay even beyond, think, where a lot of cities don't have that opportunity or it's very limited to certain, certain officers. Um, code enforcement. I don't know what violations um, are repeated. I know that we've struggled sometimes in the court. Um, but I'll look into your area and let me see. It may be us getting our own way. And so let's analyze those one by one and address those. Um, and I think that's how we'll be able to enforce that. We've got more enforcement going now, more cases than we've ever had, and continuing to push that. But we also need neighborhood help with that. Um, I tell you, we're going to try something different, hopefully. The technology is being done right now in Greenville in a test which it's a, basically a system that mounts to garbage trucks and it analyzes every yard it goes by. Garbage trucks are the only truck that goes into every neighborhood and every house. And it analyzes it, it will tell us if their roof's in repair, it basically videotapes it, grass is not cut, so forth. So it gives us technology that we can enhance our code enforcement and then start looking after those habitual offenders and how do we deal with that to improve the whole quality of the neighborhood. Uh, and making sure that everybody's doing their part, being part of that puzzle. Um, Jack S. asked about, are there any incentives in the office pushing to attract individual and corporate investment? Absolutely. We're sharing with everybody the opportunities from what's available through the state, which is everything from abandoned building taxes to even cutting our tax. Ultimately, you know, for attraction, it is quality of life is part of it, but the incentives that go with it. But we have to have that incentive's got to be balanced. Because the one thing right now, the way the system's set up, is that if you're a big company, you get the better end of the deal. Well, we're made up of a lot of small businesses. So our ultimate goal is to modernize the tax system and use it to our advantage so that we can support our small businesses just like we do our big businesses. Because small businesses grow, they become medium businesses. But the whole time they're here, they're not looking for incentives back and forth. They're hiring people and they're investing here and they become part of our community. So we got to have a balanced approach. But when we're going to sell people and we talk about it, it's the opportunities that are here too. It's not just about tax incentive. It's about the opportunity about being in a market that people support you. That you have, we're, we're not tapped out yet all at all. We have so much room to grow and so much opportunity for people to invest. I mean, the two biggest corners in our community that could be great corporate towers are parking lots sure. on Assembly and Gervais Street. Think about if that was two towers filled with 500 people going to work, living two blocks away, and going down to the river to the beer keller and having a beer in the afternoon right before they go float. That's what people want to see. The greatest investment we had on Main Street was student housing. Why? Because students began walking up and down Main Street. It created life. Look at it now. We got successful restaurants from one end to the other and more investment having, more people living down there. People want to see activity. They want to see, so when we incentivize, we're selling them about the quality of life as well, not just the tax credits. Um, that's that's, that's our, our, it's a lot of information, I know. Um, I'm glad to hang around and answer any 
uh, pointed questions. I know some people need to, to get on um, their night, but I'm glad to hang around. If you have anything that, that you want to leave on a comment card, we have that. I'm glad to answer that and send it back in writing, but I'll be here to answer uh, any questions afterwards. I appreciate y'all coming. We're trying something different. Um, we'll see what the feedback is, but we thought maybe it'd be better to come to you instead of coming to a state of the city that um, is really not talking directly to y'all and with y'all and engaging with y'all. So uh, I hope it was worth your hour and 34 minutes you just spent with me. Uh, but I'm excited about Columbia. I continue to wake up every day and very proud uh, to be the mayor. Uh, I get energized every day about selling Columbia. Uh, I'm getting, I might be a little obnoxious about it sometimes as I'm around the country, but I just think it's time for us. I think it's time for us to be in the lead. I think it's time for us to shine. I think we have too much to sell, too many people, too much diversity, too much culture, international community. I mean, we have so much that when you tell people about Columbia, when I stood up at the Harvard Bloomberg program and, and I gave my description of Columbia, people were like, Columbia, South Carolina? Why don't you tell anybody? I said, well, I'm telling you now, and you, I'm going to be telling you for the next four years at least. Um, so I hope you'll join me in continuing to push our community. We're getting there. We're not perfect. We haven't completed everything. We're learning. We're improving. Uh, but I hope you'll get on the, on, on the train with us as we continue to move our city forward. Thank you for being here.